I've been having an issue where after this thing sits long enough to have to cold start it, I crank the battery to death and it just won't fire. I'm pretty sure everything capable of causing this is all that's wrong. And that's just scratching the surface. I only have one tiny little one inch gap in here where I'm only able to fit one of my cameras to show you what's also going on with the power steering pump. This camera struggles with a few things and audio is one of them. Hates loud noises, you'll see. This is the tightest fit for power steering that I've ever seen in something with a 4G63 swap. You can see that there's a lot going on from headlights to engine mounts, intercooler pipes, wideband sensor parts, power steering hoses, and the reservoir, and, and really it's also a super tight squeeze up against the frame rails for the accessory pulleys to boot. Less than half the width of the belt gap. The only camera I have that can see any of this is an experiment in fisheye microscopy, and that's just how tight it is here. The microphone will fail from the belt squeal and volume changes caused by starting the engine. Nothing I can do about it, it's a feature. But you can see a clean spot on the bolt for the pulley whenever it's cranking. Once you hear the belt start squealing, the microphone just quits until all that racket stops. And right before the audio fades back in, watch the flashing of that clean spot on that center of the pulley bolt change speeds. Because whatever resistance there is disappears. I've tightened the belt, but it comes right back, especially on cold days. It could be a mechanical problem in a number of different ways, including the pump, the belt, hey, any of this. But it could be hydraulic too. And depending on what I find, it could even be related to those hard starts that I've been experiencing, so there's really no downside to going through all of this. These were the tools that I thought I was going to use to try to fix it. My, how short of a memory I have of the last time I messed with it. I swear I mentally blocked this job. I've clearly forgotten how servicing anything, including the belt tension itself, requires extensive disassembly of my engine bay, at least on this car. If you were hoping to learn something about your Elantra in this video, sorry. Your power steering doesn't look anything like this, and that will only grow more apparent as we go on. This might even leave the DSM crew scratching their heads before this is all over. They don't have any of these problems to deal with either, and neither should you. In order to remove this car's power steering pump, it's not just intercooler pipes that have to be removed. I'm not that lucky. Here's why. I can perform acts of martial arts and acrobatics to remove these belts and bolts securing the pump. But then, you can't remove the pump. It's practically touching the radiator, and you can't wiggle the pulley in its mounting bracket, and you can't get it out of there. So, take the bracket off, right? It's only three bolts. Bolts that you don't have room to put a socket on. When you calculate having to flip your crescent wrench over 12 different times to make a single revolution on a bolt that's nine threads deep in the hole and that's only one of them, you have an uncomfortable choice to make. So for me, whether I want to suffer here, right here on this bolt, or somewhere else, suffering is required in order to accomplish otherwise simple tasks. In order to get this power string pump out of this engine bay, first the radiator has to come out. Well, either the radiator or the timing side engine mount, so let's just start with that radiator, shall we? If the radiator has to go, then so do all the other things attached to it. I mean, mostly. This is where the acrobatics part comes into play. Not only is it my boost control solenoids mount, my radiator fans are also permanently attached to the front as pusher fans because there's no other possible way to fit a fan in this engine bay. That comes complete with wiring for both fans, plus a thermal switch. And I can't remove the flexolites with the radiator in the car, so I'm going to use acrobatics to avoid breaking the perfect seal on my J-pipe. Yeah, I can take the J-pipe off and make this a lot easier, too. It takes a 90 degree turn, and this can only fit out the passenger side of the car. It's kind of like Tetris, but with the consequences that cost you a radiator if you lose the game. But with that out of the way, now it's really easy to get at that pump. I put a pan below it because I plan to spring a few leaks here. In my quest to stop the belt squeal, I ran a cycle of ATF through this thing. One of the things that I plan to do is flush this out completely with regular old power steering fluid again. I bought another power steering pump for a turbo DSM in case there's a bearing problem that's contributing to that squeal. And also because this one's at least 30 years old, it's, it's not leaking and it seems to turn freely with no play, but I've got a freshly rebuilt pump here. When's the next time I want to be back in here doing this again? Yeah, this isn't fun. You can see how tight the pump is and its mounting bracket, how it sits up under the engine mount bracket. Easy to see why the radiator has to go. Steel is an awfully stubborn thing. Look how tight it is even here between the crank pulley bolt and the frame rail. That's less than half the width of a belt. It's even tighter at the alternator. If pump resistance is contributing to any of that noise, 
well, I could have a problem with the reservoir or the filter that are contributing to it. So anyway, the lines aren't kinked and they don't appear to be leaking anywhere. But if there's anything that I can replace here, I'm going to. I'm, I plan to do that. It doesn't fit. Not only does it not fit, but the problem's grown even stupider because now I have power steering pumps multiplying and daggone it, none of them are the right ones. This is the one off the Gallant VR4. And you see it's got this uh, pipe sticking out the side here. None of the replacement pumps come with this part. And you can see that here's the 1G turbo. The housing is you know, like cut away for that piece. For, for this thing to fit on here and the bolt centers it uses these nice little small I guess those are what M6 bolts here's the one that's on the Hyundai using M8 bolts on the flange the pump dimensions and everything here are basically exactly the same if you line it up you can see the distances on the pulleys and everything it's, it's all identical to the 1G turbo stuff with that that fitting that flange different frustrating well you would think it'd be real simple you know just use the one off the 1g turbo we only have one for the gallant <laughs> i'm not changing any of that that's getting rebuilt it would have been nice to be able to use this since it's the same exact pump just take a nice rebuilt one that i now own because as you can see here trying to make the diameter of this big old pipe that was here fit this 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 pump. <laughs> I kind of manually changed it, you know, altered it a little bit. Big hole. The bolt centers are different. So even if that would have worked, the flange won't bolt it down. Either I can do a ton of modification to make it work, which I don't want to have to get around to. Or I could order the one for a Hyundai Elantra, which is clearly not the right one. There you go. Like none of the stuff is even on the, on the same side. Doesn't even have this part on it. No pulley. And the only thing that's weird here is there's that mystery pump that's on the Elantra and there's the 1G and there's the VR4 no bolt no nut just pressed on this one's bolted and nutted on and so is that one I don't know what is it I can't find it I keep buying pumps these are getting expensive 110 bucks each try so I guess it's out of an abundance of frustration that I'm just going to throw parts at it. Uh, I actually happen to be able to get my hands on an original Hyundai Elantra power steering reservoir in the aftermarket. I kind of can't believe that that's parts available, but it was cheap. It's like 20 bucks. Not bad. A shiny new part for the Elantra. That's just funny. Okay, well, I think... Uh, that abundance of frustration means that I'm going to be putting the original pump back on it. So I'm going to swap some seals and pieces over and try to see if I can get by with just the other fixes. The original belt isn't dry rotted, greasy, or cracked, and it's not any bigger than the belt that I'm replacing it with, so it didn't stretch. But I did notice the shape of it was worn concave on both sides rather than the more convex shape of the new belt. The new belt fits the pulley much better. The pump that was on this thing actually spins every bit as easy and smooth as the freshly rebuilt one out of the box. Going into this, I was hoping to throw every new part at this that I could, just to quit ever having to deal with it or worry about it. But, I have absolutely no clue what this power steering pump came from to replace it. None of the pumps I bought include that fitting. This is just one of the problems that you wind up having when you build a car out of a few different friends' scrap parts that came from a dozen different cars spanning decades. At least I have a spare identical pump for the Gallant in case that rebuild plan that I have for it turns south. 
Nothing more I can do right now for the Elantra but put all the things back in and fill up all the stuff and see if she still squeals. I added power steering fluid but I'll flush it later after this test. I'm pretty happy with that. The different shape of the power steering belt seems to do the trick. I noticed it put me in a different range of adjustment than the old belt allowed me. It's a different brand than the one I replaced, but time will tell if it holds up any better. I actually broke a few things while fixing other things. You didn't see me break loose and reseal the oil pressure sending unit that made a tiny little drizzle on Matt's floor when we dynoed it. After all that work to seal it up too. I just did the same thing again, but this time it's better, trust me. I rerouted the oil pressure sending unit wire and I still need to put a new ring terminal on it. I forgot to plug in the radiator fans too it looks like. Oops. Or put my intake on. Nice. Now everything's hard to get to and hot. Great job Jaffro. This heat cycle is just to burp the air out of it anyway. You probably didn't notice the brand new Die Hard Gold either. The old battery did turn out to have a defect after all and it gave up the ghost at only three years. The same battery now costs $215 after tax with a waived core charge. That's $85 more than this car's blue book value back in 2017. I guess we can rule that one out, you know. The starting and squealing problems don't appear to be related. This is just one of many problems as you can see. Hard starts don't end with just getting it to fire. What also makes it hard once the car starts moving is in height. is how there's no flow protection whatsoever on the water methanol kit that I have. And the tank is mounted higher than the nozzle, so it drains into my intercooler while it's parked. It's a waste of methanol. I don't need a semi-alcoholic swimming pool in my intake. It's a good thing that I don't have the five gallon tank for this kit, but I still experience what feels like gurgly startups and goofy idles until it all gets blown through it. You notice it less when you drive it every day, but you let it sit and it'll even straight up put the fire out. It can't be good for it. My plan to fix this is to add a solenoid to clamp off the flow unless the kit starts spraying. My super old school water methanol kit that nobody uses anymore actually has a wire on it specifically for people who want to add that feature. And I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but I figured I'd explain all of this right here where you just saw the problem that it's causing. With the coolant system happy and on a cold engine different day, I figured it's time to plug all the things in that I forgot on the burp cycle and then bleed the power steering system. My plan was to take the return line from the power steering cooler and drain it into the pan under the car and to put a hose above the fluid level on the reservoir so that it doesn't dump out everywhere. I struggled hard with this. Not only can I not see anything that I'm trying to manipulate because it's so tight, but installing these hoses on a filled system gets everything greasy really fast. I had to put the radiator back in and burp it because I have to run the engine for long enough in order to cycle out all the fluid that I could damage it if I didn't have coolant in it. So despite the easy access for this when the radiator was out, I had to reassemble it and do it the hard way. If I understand the flow correctly, I won't make a mess. Uh, whoops. Wouldn't you know it, I got it exactly backwards. I spliced exactly the wrong hose, pumped air into the rack, made a horrible greasy mess all inside my engine bay, and I'm the last person whom you should ever take advice from for power steering service. I understand exactly what I was trying to do, but failed miserably in the execution. By the time I took everything apart to clean up my mess, the memory card expired, and I'm up to my elbows in power steering fluid and not touching that camera until I'm clean. I put the hose back on the low pressure side and drained it the rest of the way, and if there's a lesson here, don't do what I did. Make sure you tap the low pressure line from the rack, not the pump when you do this. Why do you do this to me, Hyundai? I've fixed so many of your problems. Brakes, axles, wiring, engine management, fuel, exhaust, suspension, cooling, steering. I keep expecting it to cooperate with me on a job, but it's been like this ever since Big Red showed up. All this is getting addressed because I want this car in worry-free daily driver status. The latest changes to the tune and the suspension don't need to be hampered by stupid problems like oil leaks, starting issues, leaky water methanol kits, and accessory belt squeal.
It's full. You bleed the rack by turning it lock to lock and holding it for three seconds each time. Air that gets frothed into it settles over time, so I'll let it sit overnight, check it, and top it off tomorrow. Now to fix the oil pressure sending unit wire for the last time. It's routed out of sight and safely around all the pulleys now. I just need to crimp a new ring terminal on it and then test it again. That is an awful lot of work to have to do just to change a belt. I prepared for the worst with the power steering and even bought two extra wrong pumps and got everything from the diagnosis to the system flush wrong because it's just buried so tight in there I can't see any of it without taking it all apart and handling it. I made a mess, but no more belt squeal, brand new battery, fixed oil pressure sending unit wire, and oil leak. Ultimately, I ended up with four out of four fixes despite all of my suffering so far. Only one more to go before I feel comfortable driving this car to its potential on a daily basis. I quit this car, but now it's the next day. Why am I right back here again for more punishment? Notice how much easier it is to get to everything on this side of the car because of the battery tray that I made. Just two cables, coolant overflow bottle, and three easily accessible 12 millimeter bolts. You can see where the water methanol line runs from the nozzle and back towards the firewall. Somewhere along that hose is where I want to mount the solenoid. I could use just about any existing bolt and make a bracket to secure it. I've, I find it interesting that there's this unemployed 10 millimeter hole sticking up right here looking for work. That would be the single biggest bolt hole I've ever seen securing a solenoid bracket. But I still can't help but be grateful for it. This is what the solenoid looks like. I get two random screw holes on top of it to mount it, and I have to be mindful of the flow direction. All I have to do is make a bracket to fit that hole, screw the solenoid to it, mount it, split that hose, and shove it into both push lock connectors. To resolve the tap handle size issue, I found the party side of the tap was a little bit smaller than my quarter inch extension, so I busted out the foot long. I put it in the tap handle, and it actually made it really easy to keep the business end straight. I blew it out with compressed air, and there's the threads I needed. Found an M10 bolt that'll do. Now I just need a bracket. Thank you for the hole, Mitsubishi. Here I got a piece of 3 16th inch steel bar stock. That'll be plenty rigid. It's function over form here though. I won't be doing anything fancy because nobody's ever going to be able to see it when the battery's installed. I just need to drill a few holes and beat this thing into a reasonable shape for my purposes. If I paint this, it's not to make it pretty. It's because if I don't, it's going to rust. Definitely it's going to rust. If I deburr it, it's just so I won't cut myself on it when working on other things. I'm still in the test fitting stage here before I worry about any of that. And I guess, uh, yeah, while I was digging around in here, testing out the fit, the Hyundai must have heard me say that something was easy to work on. Can't have that. While I was test fitting the water methanol bracket, I bumped the transmission mount with my hand and saw it move. Oh, sh so once again, the Hyundai extends the long finger of diplomacy. There's one bolt laying in the transmission mount, the other's nowhere to be found. But looking down inside it, the threads inside of both holes are absolutely wrecked. I grabbed another bolt and tried to put it back together again anyways, just to confirm what I saw. I'm lucky I've got solid roll stopper mounts. The last time these trans mount bolts were handled was seven years ago, like when I rebuilt the engine. I apparently didn't catch the moment that they stripped out, so it looks like I've been driving around on only three out of four of my engine mounts ever since. I've worked on dozens of things in here, but fixing what I thought would be the last thing wrong with the car's reliability brought me to this nice little gem of a problem. I'm skeptical that this is going to hold at all based off what the wrench felt like when they were tight. Did I just rip them out right back out? Yep. Yep. This is not good, y'all. Not good. This is terrible. Worst case scenario. No transmission mount. Both bolts are stripped. This had to have happened immediately after I installed the engine and set the car on the ground and started it for the first time. Tough pill to swallow, but I'm honest about this kind of stuff. Couldn't have a worse problem. If I can't bolt the transmission to the mount, then the transmission case is shot. They're a whole lot harder to find than the right power steering pump is for this car. You can see on the bottom right side of that hole how the bolt ripped out and took the threads right with it. So that hole's an oval now. It's going to be tricky to fix even without how packed this engine bay is, but anyway, I need the room to be able to operate all the tools to get a straight shot at that hole in order to fix it. 
I'm going to get the low hanging fruit out of the way with just a zip tie and move this stuff over to the side for now. I want to see how much room I have to do this job. The thread repair kit doesn't seem to have large tools, but when you consider the drill you'll need, or the size of the tap handle you have, that's where things start to get tricky. The kit comes with a 12.3mm drill bit, says 12.24, close enough. I've got a standard set with decent graduation and my plan is to sneak up on that 12.3mm hole to give me the best shot at keeping the hole straight in its original location. The big drill bit will misalign itself if I try to go straight in at it. So once I figured out if I've got a straight shot, I'm going to use this other 11.8mm drill bit, which is only slightly larger than the original hole. But before I even do that, I'm using the next size smaller one because it fits all the way down in the hole snugly. Well, most of the way. And if I can do that with the drill on it, then I have room to drill it. And of course not! The brake master cylinder obstructs the drill on one side, and the frame side of the transmission mount obstructs the other. I don't like my options here, but really there's no other way around it. Both of the roll stopper engine mounts need to come loose. It'll only be secured by one mount while I'm doing this. Man, I'm so grateful that Jamie made solid roll stopper mounts or else I wouldn't even have an engine right now. I need to move the whole engine forward and down at least a half inch, and now's a good time to have an extra jack stand handy for safety. It's not supporting the transmission. I'm going to do all that stuff with the jack, but you'll need it just in case anything stupid happens. You don't want to be under here without it. This isn't as bad as the power steering job, especially not up front. With a 3 inch exhaust, cross member, and torque box in the way, I can't even see what I need to do on the, you know, on the rear mount from here. But next thing you know, I'm climbing all over the top of my engine like a jungle gym in order to reach the bolt that must be held still, and to orient the wrench in a way that lets me operate both from underneath it. Did I ever tell you how much I love jumping up and down on dirty concrete for an hour during peak pollen tree trash season? For a good portion of this, I was looking the other way because the exhaust wrap was shedding onto my face and also embedding itself into my wrist. We're all good though. It's, you know, this is how your car says thank you. You'll just have to speak its language. The only way to stay fluent is to practice jabbing my arms into dark places filled with sharp things to work my sense of feel. Uh, see what I'm saying? Stick your hand is dirt. <laughs> That's my style. So anyway, I got the mounts loose and there's enough clearance away from the brake master cylinder to fit the drill now. But it's only half the battle. The frame side of the transmission mount is still in the way of the other hole. You can see how those holes were relocated because this is an F5M33 transmission, not the KM210 or either of the slush box equivalents. Okay, now I can fit the drill in here with the drill bit that snugly fits almost all the way down into the bottom of each hole. I intend to correct the angle of the hole since it was ovaled out when it was stripped and then drill the rest of the way through the threads that remain. I wasn't completely happy with the clamp on that intercooler pipe, so I gotta move that thing. I'm working over here. It's really a tight spot to do this, but I want that angle to be perfect. The hole is the absolute most important part of this repair, and I do the same thing for both holes, and then I'm gonna step back up to that 11.84 millimeter bit we found. This one was only gonna take a few more tenths of a millimeter out of the hole that I just made. Now, with both holes where I want them, I'm going to go for the recommended 12.3 millimeter bit that came with the thread repair kit. That takes care of the last half millimeter of hole. For the tap portion, I'm doing the exact same thing I did earlier with the quarter inch extension in the tap. But this time, I grabbed the 3 8 inch unit and made a perfect fit for the tap with three layers of painter's tape. It didn't fit without a second foot of extension on it, but just like before, it's helping me to keep that tap straight. That was a handy little trick that managed to work for me a second time. It's bush engineering, I know, but, you know, we all know it works for M10 and M12 taps in a pinch now. You just have to be able to make the right hole and then have a straight shot at it with a tap. The thread insert's the easy part. You just run it down in the hole you just made and put the tang end down inside the hole and screw it in until the back side is about a half thread deep in the threads. Then you break the little tab off and this kit came with a tool for that. Some do, some don't, but you really don't need it. You can use the installer tool or your own punch as recommended, needle nose pliers if you can reach it. That can be enough for the small ones, they're delicate though. Most will break off if you push the installer tool into the hole too hard or if you try to back the thread insert out of the hole using it. So if you need to go in that direction, remove the tool and then turn the insert on its outward facing side by hand to avoid breaking off the tab. 
I'm telling you and explaining this to you now because the camera battery died and after I replaced it, I got out of sync with my record button. You missed shooting the install. I suck at this, I told you. So with the thread inserts installed, I just have to put the same length bolts back into those holes to hold the transmission mount in place. Hopefully this time I can fully torque these to have a solid transmission mount. The thread inserts essentially add a millimeter more extra contact surface between the bolt and the threads on the part side, and the insert material is stronger than the transmission casting. Therefore, it leaves me with what should be a stronger, tougher hole than I had to begin with. Some people pay doctors good money for that, but this is what Jaffro gets for 22 bucks in his backyard. I have to put the other half of the mount back on in order for the, any of this to have done me any good at all. Based on how long these bolts weren't attached to the transmission, you might think that they're optional, but I'm hopeful to test the result. We've got seven years worth of before examples. I want to get this thing back on the track, something fierce now, and I got an invite. New suspension, boost control solenoid bugs worked out, the tune was happy, mostly, before we did this. It's still tuned for 93 octane, but I adjusted the methanol kit. Speaking of methanol kit, remember installing that damn nozzle is where we left off, as well as what just put me through all this extra work. I ground off everything sharp with the bench grinder and polished the scratches and scales off of it for paint, and then I turned my attention to the reverse switch, which I noticed had a broken wire on it. This doesn't go through the engine harness that I just replaced, and I have spare parts for these connectors, or so I thought. It turns out the black ones have different terminals in them than the gray ones do, and I have spare terminals for the gray ones. I'll fix this tomorrow. I'm running out of daylight and I still gotta paint the other side of the bracket and let it dry anyway. The first thing I did the next day was finish fixing the reverse switch, and that was when I discovered the problem with the gray and black connectors not aligning right. Mm. Why did I do that? I found a way to make the new replacement pins fit the old plug, and they make great contact. They're still watertight and it stays together but they don't lock into the connector very well. And the last thing I did yesterday was stuff the solenoid wires through the shifter boot. Just look at all that crap all over me from the trees. I'm pretty sure that I'll need to extend these wires to get the rest of the way to their destinations. Going back over all of the data that I have on my AEM version 1 methanol injection kit, it actually turns out it does not have provisions for a water methanol solenoid. So it can't tell an external device to turn on and off after all. It's going to take more creative wiring than I currently have in order to make this thing work, and it's going to take more creativity than the time I have to figure it all out in. I promise I'll come up with something for this car to make it that much more awesome, but for right now, I just need to get my car ready for race day, which is today. So, after a considerable amount of time reading, researching, watching my own installation videos, trying to remember what I did exactly, and trying to find out all the other people who are struggling with the same problem, I find that everyone has the V2 kit that already has the brown and white wire on it that mine doesn't have. So I just hardwired it to a switched electrical source that opens whenever the car is running. This doesn't provide me with the same kind of consistency or backflow protection that the controller operating the solenoid would provide, but what it does do is prevent me from dumping the whole bottle of juice into the intercooler while the car is parked. That was my real problem to begin with. I put the final torque of 39 foot-pounds on the transmission bolts, tightened everything else that I took loose back down, and put the battery back in it. Because in order to test my solenoid wiring, it needs a battery. The gates are about to open at the track, it's an hour away, and I'm in med scramble mode while operating cameras with my whole dashboard apart. What am I doing? Some of this I won't have time to film. I don't want to keep everybody waiting there, and the event's not going to wait for me. With my local track closed permanently, I have to travel an hour in any direction to find a place to do my testing. This is one of the main reasons why I have to make this car a stable, secure daily driver and squash all of its bugs. The last thing I need to do is have a starting problem an hour away from my tools. I fired it up. No squeal, no hesitation, no fight. Cold oil pressure doing exactly what it does. Volts are happy. Engine's cold. ECU's waking up trying to figure out where it is and once again discovering it's still installed in a four-door Elantra. What I'm doing with the test is watching the wideband air fuel ratio gauge. I'm pressing the purge button on the water methanol controller to make it spray and seeing if my air fuel ratio drops. You'll see the blue light on the panel activate whenever I press the button. 
I'm pleased to report that when energized, the solenoid is open, and I'm able to do this to fix the leaking parked condition until some other time later when I have more time to tackle a better fix. I didn't have the time necessary to complete the shooting of the dashboard reassembly, but you can watch my other videos if you really need that. While testing this, my host showed up, probably wondering where I was. So in a mad scramble, I reassembled it, put the car back on the ground, and boogied my tail an hour north to Dominion Raceway. I've never been here before. It's an asphalt, no prep, outlaw, eighth mile track, complete with novelty tree. This place is evolving. I made it there and back without incident to have a good time with my friends, and really that's what this sport has always been all about. This is Chad Leary's GSX that you've probably seen featured at DSM Tuners if you're a member. All of us are here to do some kind of testing to our Frankensteins, and it didn't take very long for me to find mine still has a few deficiencies. Some caused by my own repairs, and some I discovered because I'm using the car differently than I used to. I never used to drive it at night, you'll see. <laughs> I heard a rumor that there wasn't any traction to be had, so I left gingerly in an attempt to stick. It almost worked. I stuck first, but had to short shift second and third because the tires wouldn't hold what I was sending to them. Better luck next time, I guess. Hey, you're on the wrong side of the car. You need to move over. Yeah. <laughs> That's Abe. He's got a JDM right-hand drive MR2 fresh off the boat that he's done a little bit of work to. It should be interesting to see how the Elantra stands up next to an equal-sized turbo import that can actually produce a 60-foot. Abe actually had a hand as well as parts into this car's history that predates even me. So I want to make him proud. I felt like I left too soft last time, so I figured I'd maybe try to add an extra spoonful of beans. I feel weird not wearing a helmet. Huh? I feel weird not wearing a helmet. Aside from finding traction, as well as a new set of windshield wipers, so far the only fix left that I've been able to find on this thing is an intermittent driver's side headlight. Could just be the bulb, whatever it is, I kinda need to take care of that. Too many beans. Spinning ain't winning. This car's 60 foot is why I prefer quarter mile races, but with my tires up in smoke, Abe earned that one fair and square. Less beans for me next time. I know what you really want to see though, a free ride on this rocket ship.
Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I know I do. My rocket ship is still in the shop. So I've been making sure the escape pod works properly for now. Thank you, Patreon, for sponsoring my suffering and all the things that I do. I thank all of you for tuning in, and I'll be back again soon with another turgid episode. Until then, stay tuned!